Hey kids, Adam here. Today we're going to talk all about compression. Well, breaking news, this just in. Dyslexic terrorists have taken over the National Zoo. They're holding three ostriches. Hey kids, Adam here. Today we're going to talk all things compression. What is compression? How do you use it in your mix? What does it do? What all the little doodads and selectors and uh, ratios and thresholds and attacks and releases, what all that means. And uh, I'm going to do my best to explain it the way I've learned it. Now, before we get into this, this is not a hugely technical video on different types of compressors or what they do or how one is different from the other. I'll get in a little bit of that or like the algorithms behind compression or all the math and all the electronics. It's basically going to be how I understood compression and how I use it in my mixes, how I've been successful in the mixes that I've done uh, and hopefully be able to teach you the same things that I've learned so you have a better understanding of it. There's a lot of things out there and a lot of videos where Somebody will make a little tiny adjustment and see, oh, you can really hear that come to life. And you're like, I don't hear anything. Like, what am I supposed to be listening to? I don't hear that. I don't understand the difference. I don't know. Uh, so hopefully I can help better define what things mean and help you kind of better understand what compression is. A few weeks ago, there was a post on Rug on Facebook. That's the Reaper Users Group or unofficial Reaper Users Group or whatever it's called. Um where somebody said something like, hey, I've been working with audio for a long time. I still really don't understand what compression is. And of course, like any generic post like that, I received a lot of answers and a lot of really crazy all over the place answers from people who were just flat out wrong to people who were way overly complex. Like if you give that answer to a beginner, they're not going to have any idea where to start. Now that said, some of the questions and answers were interesting. Um, a lot of people said, oh, it takes the loud parts and makes them quieter, and it takes the quiet parts and makes them louder, or it squashes things, or, you know, and there's just a lot of different answers. If you think about what compression is in its simplest form uh, in audio, it is an intelligent volume switch that turns things down when they hit a certain volume level. So don't think of it as bringing loud parts up. Think of it as taking loud things and bringing them down. Um, now... A lot of things you'll see in audio is you'll see, like I said, a video where a guy will say, oh, listen to this little adjustment, how it brings things to life. And you're like, I don't hear that. I don't, what are you doing? I don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm, I'm not hearing the difference. In mixing, when we, when we do a mix, we have dozens of channels. We have all sorts of effects and volumes and automation and panning and all that stuff. We're doing dozens to maybe hundreds of tiny little almost imperceptible moves that when put on a grand scale all together is what makes the mix. So if I say I'm going to take do 3 dB a gain reduction here, I'll explain what that is in a little bit. W what does that mean? You're probably not going to hear that in the context of just one little thing, especially if it's like a, like a distorted guitar or maybe even bass. But then you add all those things together and it makes the mix. There's no real like magic button or magic wand or magic plugin. You can just go poof and it just fixes everything in your mix. There's no giant like, here's what this sounds like now. And now we put a plugin on it sounds like this and that's going to fix our mix. It's all these little tiny little things. Now that said, it's going to be hard to hear some things. Uh, I'm going to try to exaggerate things a little bit more in this video, but uh, don't try to watch this on a phone or a laptop. Watch it with headphones or earbuds or good studio monitors because there's going to be some things that are pretty subtle. Um, I'll try to explain a little bit better of what's going on in that case. And another thing is I, uh, I, I realize throughout a lot of my videos, I go into what I do, but I don't really go into why. Um, like I put a compressor on and say, I'm really aiming for three to five dB of gain reduction. And I don't say why. Um, now, I will say that a lot of the why comes from learning uh, and picking up, like I, I used to listen to a lot of Graham's uh, videos from the Recording Revolution. Graham, I'm sorry you're not doing videos anymore. I hope everything's okay. I know you're running things behind the scenes, but um, that really was what got me into audio engineering in the first place, other than the fact that I had to do it because no one else would in the band or could, and we didn't really want to pay anyone, so I decided to learn on my own. That's another story for another day, uh, and I might have told part of that already, 
But one of the things he said is you kind of want to go for subtle compression and, and pile it on top of each other. Again, those dozens to hundreds of little mixing moves, you stack compression and, 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 and not really stack, but you know, compression here, compression there, compression here, compression there. Um, that's how you will go about getting a mix that sounds good. So three to five dB was his kind of a starting point. And then from there, he would kind of adjust with his ears. I, a lot of the times will aim for three to five dB and set it and forget it. And if it, if it needs changing, I'll change. A lot of times I don't, I'll just, I know that's like the magic level for me that if I do these certain things in this order, it works out. So that said, let's uh, let's head over to Reaper and let's dive into some of this stuff, try to explain what some of this is, how we use it. Uh, I, I'm warning you, this intro is already pretty long. The video is going to be long. I'm going to go into a lot of things in kind of a lot of detail with a lot of examples and a lot of different plugins. Let's go over there now. All right, here we are on Reaper. And if you haven't seen this, you haven't really worked with Reaper. This is Reaper's built-in compressor called Recomp. It's not very pretty. There's some sliders, there's some numbers, there's a bunch of stuff. But each of these things is going to come into play in almost every compressor that you work with. Some compressors may have fewer uh, options. Some may even have more. Um, but this is where you're really going to, the, the heart of the matter. I'm going to go through each one of these things and tell you what it is. All right, the first thing is the threshold. What the threshold is, is anything below this threshold, it's going to apply compression to. So what you wanna do when you do a compressor after you get all your other things that we'll talk about in a second set up, is you bring your threshold down and anything then below the level gets compressed uh, at the levels that we talk about. So uh, all, some compressors also call the threshold the input, and it's basically what you're putting into the compressor, and the more you put in, the more it compresses. So it's almost like the reverse of the threshold. Uh, we'll go down these kind of one by one. Uh, Precomp is, and a lot of these I'm taking right from the Reaper manual. Um, so uh, if you see me glancing over to my other monitor here, I'm cheating because I have cheat notes over here. I don't have a fancy teleprompter like some guys, and I really don't like scripting out a lot of my videos, but uh, here we are. So according to the Reaper manual, the Re precomp allows compression to gradually begin before the threshold is reached. So this means, let's say the threshold at, is at negative 12.7. Um, any audio below negative 12.7, or I, I should say above 12.7, uh, as far as the, you know, if you if you assume all your audio never goes above zero, anything between zero and 12.7, that's the target that's going to be compressed. The pre-comp, let's say we set it to three milliseconds or something, 2.7, 2.7 milliseconds before it hits that threshold is when the compression will start, and it'll gradually go up until it hits that threshold. I don't use this very often. Um, it is useful in some cases if you want to do more of a over effect, but uh, I wouldn't worry about this right now. I would leave it at zero until you get really familiar with it. The attack is the time, and the, granted this is in milliseconds, the time it takes for the compressor to start clamping down on the audio. Um, default in Recomp is three milliseconds. It's a good place to start. It works well for things like transients, like snare, kick, um, slap bass, piano, uh, acoustic guitar, things like that. The more you increase the attack, the more it waits to clamp down on the audio. So if you have something a little maybe slower, like a, a finger pluck bass or distorted guitar, you may want to increase the attack. You'll notice it kind of goes up to 500 milliseconds, which is half a second, which doesn't seem like that long, but there is quite a noticeable difference between three milliseconds and 500 milliseconds when it comes to audio and how fast it processes. On the other side, the release is after it starts compressing, how fast it lets go. Uh, default and recomp is 100 milliseconds, and um, depends. We'll play a little bit with this later on in the video on how this affects things like transients. Longer release will let more of the transient through. Shorter release will clamp down on the transient shortly after it comes in. Uh, but that's what that does. There is an auto release function on Recomp and some other compressors will have it, in which case this really doesn't matter. It'll deal with auto release yourself. I like manually adjusting it to make sure it does what I want it to. Ratio. If you look up compression ratio, well, you have to look up audio compression ratio because there's like mechanical compression ratio and that I don't even understand. You're going to get a lot of different um, descriptions on it. The one that uh, I found that was kind of the best is 
higher ratio means more compression, lower ratio means less. One to one ratio is essentially no compression. Why would you even want that? And if you want to use some other things in your compressor for uh, maybe some color or something like that. Um, so a four to one ratio means for every four decibels below the threshold or above, however you want to look at it, uh, the compressor allows one decibel through. Another way of thinking about it is for every one decibel of audio, it's turning it down by four decibels. Sometimes that's not exactly correct. That's kind of the way to think about it. Common um, ratios, now, now granted, Recomp lets you do all these crazy two and three decimal point ratios. Common ones will be two to one, four to one, eight to one, 12 to one, 20 to one. Uh, I would start with those. I would not mess with the ratio on a sliding scale when you're getting used to it. That will really, really kind of mess you up. Uh, knee size. This is one you'll not see on a lot of compressors, um, especially one of the simpler ones that we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, knee size says the range of volume the compressor, compressor is applied. Uh, at 0 dB, it applies as soon as the threshold is exceeded um, based on your attack. At 10 dB, the ratio is gradually increased from 1, D, 1 to 1 to 4 to 1 when the volume exceeds the threshold by a full 10 dB. So it's almost like a smoothing out. Um, there are also, you'll see like hard knee and soft knee. Soft knee is a more gradual. Hard knee is more um, uh, not as gradual. For most of the things I do, I leave the knee size at 0. Uh, detector inputs. Don't worry about this unless you're side chaining. I'm not going to get into side chaining in this video. It is very, very, uh, it's a different type of thing. I don't use it in my music. Uh, you, It's a whole completely different video. Look up like Reaper Mania, uh, Kenny Joy's videos and side chaining. Uh, and if I find one, I'll put a card up for it here. Uh, low pass and high pass are the frequency ranges of which it will compress. So if you put the low pass at say 6K or 5K, then like the sibilance, the S's, will not be compressed in this compressor. If you put the high pass at like 100, then things like plosives, like uh, um, thumps or p -p -p, that kind of thing without a pop filter or this little thing I have around my microphone, those will not get be compressed. Um, uh, sometimes I'll work with this, sometimes I won't. Most of the time I leave them at the default. And then RMS size is another one of these things that the definition behind it is is um, confusing. I look at it as it look it almost like a pre comp in a way, but it looks at the peaks and valleys and does an average of them as you go through the audio. So the more you set it, if you set it up to you know I think the default is five. I set mine to zero because I just wanted things to to work as they come in. If you set it to five, it's going to take an average of the five milliseconds of time around uh, your cursor um, or in front of it and then average the peaks and valleys there and work on the compression that way. If you want to keep it at five to start, that's fine. If you want to keep it at zero to start, that's fine. It's more of an advanced option. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Now we get into the output mix or uh, makeup gain, or what else is it called? Just output on some. This is what's going to happen, and you'll, you'll find this out in a little bit when I do a demo. When you, because it's an intelligent volume knob, it's turning things down. What the output mix does is it turns the entire thing after it's been turned on back up. And that's where some people say a compressor will make the loud parts quiet and the quiet parts loud. Eh, kind of, not exactly. Uh, in Recomp, we have both the wet and the dry. The wet passes through the compressed signal, which is going to be on most compressors, just the output. The dry will pass through the uncompressed and unprocessed dry signal in case you want to mix the two together. There's In Reaper, there's also this mix knob where you can do wet or dry, which also can do like a parallel mix as well. Um, some of these, there's an auto makeup gain. There's also a limit output. There's a preview of what it's actually doing. So let's do a little demo here. I'm going to use the JS tone generator to just generate some noise. Uh, so if I go off, I want to record arm this so you don't have to listen to it as much as possible. I'm going to do record output stereo, and then I'm going to put the tone generator on. It's JS tone generator as a plugin. That tone is really annoying, but probably fine. I may record. Hit save, and then I can delete the tone generator plugin so you don't have to listen to that annoying thing. Uh, now we'll zoom in a little bit and I will stretch this out. What you see here is a waveform of a perfect square wave because there are no peaks and valleys because this is a um, tone generated thing. It's perfect audio. Uh, it's annoying perfect audio, but it is perfect audio. 
what I want to do to show a compression is uh, add some volume automation in. Now, what I want to do is if I right-click on the trim, I want to add a volume envelope, but I want it to be pre-FX. So I'll choose volume pre-FX. Uh, I want to expand this a little bit and zoom out even more. And I'm just going to draw in above zero. So I'm not going to go below. I'm just going to do above and kind of just do this. And you'll see what it's doing to the wave file, waveform here. It makes the waveform look like it's being affected. So you can actually, when I play this back then, and that's annoying, you can hear it fluctuate up and down. And then if you watch the meter over here, when I play, you'll see the meters fluctuating by this, you know, how much did I go up here? Almost 6 dB or so, 5 dB, 6 dB. So what I want to do is show how a compressor works by bringing that volume down. So I'm going to go in here and add recomp in, and I will bring the threshold down until everything evens out. Now you notice a couple of things. The gain reduction meter is still fluctuating because it's still applying that compression. Um, you also notice it got really, really, really quiet. That's because it's taking the entire thing way down. What I can do then is I can use the, the wet here or the makeup gain to bring up that, or I can hit the auto makeup button. We'll do the auto makeup button first. Or I can do this manually. So then, to prove that this is really doing anything, what I can do is render this track out, and I'll just render it to mono stem track, and then you can see it's more of a bar that goes across instead of the up and down waveform that I created with the volume automation. So in a sense, this is the most basic simulation of compression that I can show where it's intelligently bringing the volume down, and then with makeup again, I can bring it back up so you can get close back to that, that even thing. Now, why would you even want to do this? Uh, let's get into some more examples. All right, in this project, um, I'm going to do some examples on a snare drum. Now, what I have is I have a snare drum that has uh, Wilkinson's Debleter uh, plug-in on it just to get, yeah, it's a gate, it's just to get rid of some cymbal stuff in there. You'll hear occasional kick drum and things like that in here. But the snare sounds like this, completely uncompressed other than the gate. And you'll notice, especially when I when I zoom in here, zoom way in, these wave levels are all over the place. Now, it's good because it gives more of a uh, natural uh, type of uh, performance, but it's bad if you want snares to really pop and really kind of be better and, and, and stand out more. What I'll do here is I'm gonna add, a, I like the Toucan plugins. Look at the card up here for my Toucan playlists. And I'm going to use the LA-1A, which is a LA-2A uh, type compressor. You'll see this doesn't have a whole lot on it. There are really two knobs. There is a gain and there's a peak reduction. Peak reduction is kind of what uh, the threshold or input were that I was talking about before. They just happen to call it peak reduction because you want to look at how much it's reducing those peaks. And then gain is going to be your makeup gain or your output. So the first thing we do is we'll play this and I'll mess with the peak reduction to get uh, different levels and listen to what it does. You'll see the meter, you know, the, the little needle here bounce. And whenever it goes, that's what the gain reduction level is. So when I say three to five dB of gain reduction, you'll see it bounce between the three and the five. If I say I'm going to slam this thing, you'll see it go above 10 or so. Just listen to how it acts to the different levels of gain reduction here. you notice when it went all the way to 100 here,
it sounds like it's like punching like a wet paper box and all that transient goes where when I put it down so there's only one or two dB of gain reduction here, listen to what that does. It's letting that natural snare sound through, but it's evening them out so that each snare is closer and closer together to being like the same volume. In rock music, that's really what you're going for. In jazz, you may not even want a compressor on your snare drum. You may want some like overhead compressors or something like that because there's going to be a lot of rolls and ghost notes and things. You don't really want to lose those dynamics. You don't want to bring those up way too much or bring everything else up too much so those are lost. Um, so this is a really good compressor to use on... Uh, in fact, you could use, you know, in the back in the old days, if the studio only had one compressor, you were going through one of these and that was it. That was your only choice. Um, this is really good. I found for, uh, guitars. I love using LA 2A in guitars. I love using, uh, it on vocals. Um, snare, I tend to use a different kind of, uh, compressor, but in my last mix, I did use this. Um, it's, it's really an all around compressor that works really well, uh, for different types of things. Um, so that is... Uh, the LA-2A, let's look at the same snare, look at a little bit like a next model up. So after this is the 1176, which is one of my favorite compressors to use. Let me just expand this window out. And this has more of the things that we were looking at. This has the attack, this has the release, this has the input and output, and it has a little button here for the ratio. Um, and actually in the old days, there was uh, on the hardware, you could hit all four buttons in and they would give it like a super compressed um, kind of a, a effect. And that's what this all in button over here does. Um, I don't want to use that. I just want to use four to one. Now, the one thing to notice on the um, 1176, it's labeled here slow to fast. On normal compressors, when you move the re attack and release all the way down, it's the fastest and you move it all the way up, it's the slowest because it's moving in increments for milliseconds. This acts more like you would expect a kind of a dial to act where you turn it up and it's the faster, turn it down and it's slower. So it's reverse of almost every other compressor out there. They tried to make it the default standard and they failed, but uh, that's okay. Um, for this, let's put both right up the middle. And in this also, the attack is in microseconds. So what is a microsecond? What is a millisecond? So one second, obviously we know what that is. A millisecond is one one thousandth of a second and a microsecond is one one thousandth of a millisecond. The attack, and, the attack numbers in 1176 are done in microseconds, which means there's really, it's fast no matter what. And there's really not a lot of difference between slow and fast on here. So I wouldn't worry about setting the attack and being too precise with it. Uh, it's not that much of a concern. Release does work with the standard milliseconds. So for a snare drum, um, let's start with the, all the way on slow. We'll start with the attack up. I'm going to get the input and uh, output to kind of bring up um, 5 to 7 dB just so you can hear it kind of be over-exaggerated. And then we'll listen to what this uh, release actually does. Now, one thing you'll notice uh, in my videos, I talk about level matching a lot. There are some times where you want to increase the volume using a compressor for effects or for compensating for other issues in the mix. I urge you to try to volume match all of your plugins so that the volume coming in is the same as the volume coming out. You, uh, It's going to take you know, uh, trial and error to learn, uh, trial by fire, if you will, to learn why. But overall, you're just going to get better control over your entire mix as far as faders and volumes and the whole thing goes if you get the same level coming in as you get the same level coming out. This also requires you gain stage things properly. Look at my uh, playlist up here for two videos I have on gain staging. But in the end, I you will be in a better spot. Uh, I know there are a lot of you who use compression. I've done it myself to increase volume and stuff that's quiet. You should probably be looking at lowering other things instead of raising the one thing. That said, another soapbox off. Let's, I'll play with the release from slow to fast. You hear what the difference is in the snare.
We'll do the same with attack. So snare, it's kind of hard to tell, especially with this compressor. There are other compressors you could put on to kind of bring out that whoosh of the snare drum. Uh, and you use that, you do that with the release. Um, but for the most part, this is uh, one of my favorite compressors. I use this on a lot of things, including bass. And actually, let's uh, let's check out a bass line. Um, we have enough just hitting the snare. Let's get the, some interesting bass going on. Uh, all I have on this is some quick EQ with re-EQ. Otherwise, there's no other uh, processing on this track. Now the bass, and if, especially if I zoom in here, as you can see, they're all over the place. The transients are really, really peaky. Um, there are much more sonic changes than in like a snare drum track. So I'm going to use the same compressor that I used uh, second on the snare, the NC76B. I like the B version because it's blue, and uh, I like blue. So uh, for bass, I like to put the attack right up the middle, keep the release at the default or this, you know, right around there. So, and then I'm, I'm ratio at four to one. I'm aiming for a three to five dB of gain reduction here. Um, but once I get that dialed in, I'll show you what it means to like over compress uh, a signal and what it sounds like for bass. Cause I think you can hear a lot better in bass. <laughs> All right, it it evens the performance out a little bit. It's uh, it's just taking those like like high peaks and bringing them down, and then as I bring the output gain up to match, it brings the lower things up a little bit. Now let me over compress this. I want to put the ratio up to twenty to one, and I'm just going to crank the input. I'll try to get the output to match, and you'll see how much uh, over compressed bass really sounds different than than a regular bass. <laughs> So you hear the difference there. It's uh, pumping. It's kind of just weird sounding. It, 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 you can tell it's, I, it's hard to explain what overcompressed is without using the words overcompressed, but it just doesn't sound good. It sounds like too much, too overprocessed, um, and that. Now that said, uh, one thing I like to do on bass, let me just make sure I'm back to the original settings here. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like to double stack these compressors. What that means is I'm putting the compressor on once, and then I'm taking that whole signal and I'm putting it into another compressor. So it's almost like a double layer of this thing. And compression in layers is really the kind of the key to mixing. Uh, you'll want compression on your instruments, on your instrument groups, on your whole mix as a, so someone like in drums, I wanna put compression on every single drum, my overheads, then the drum bus itself, and then I have a compressor on the master fader for the entire mix as well, and that just helps everything kind of glue together. Uh, I'm gonna do a video on what I call mix glue, uh, using various things such as compressors, and what that really means, because you hear that term a lot too. I'll do that sometime in the future. Probably won't hit it uh, here in 2022, uh, but maybe early next year I'll get that. So what I do for this, if you just hold down control and drag this plugin down, it creates another copy of it. And then I have two of these going, and I just want to make sure the volumes are matched. Um, so I'm going to play this and just make sure, but they should be close. <laughs> So what this does, instead of having one compressor doing 10 dB of gain reduction, this has one doing like three to five dB of gain reduction. 
and knocking those peaks down and evening things out, and then having the next one catch anything else that comes through there and doing it again. Uh, I like this effect better than double st or than single stacking and doing more compression. I think uh, more, it it kind of just helps it you know glue in. It's the best word to the whole mix as a whole. So let's do a comparison now that I have the double stack bass compressors on. I'm going to render this out. Um, and again, just render to a mono because his bass is a mono instrument. Um, and then I will, I don't want to mute it, but I'll just kind of solo both these out. And then look at the waveforms here, specifically this note. So if I solo just the original, it's just a bomb and it tapers off and you can hear it taper off and you can see the waveform taper off. When I go to the compressed one, it's the same level of volume throughout the whole thing. Now you see all these little peaks because bass is a, um, when you zoom in a, a lot, unless you're doing a like pure audio like the tone generator that I looked at, you're gonna get this when you zoom in on your waveforms. But if you look compared to the two, you can see the taper come off here. And in here you can see it you know, straight across. So what it's doing is it's bringing up those tails of the audio to make the bass more cohesive and more sticking through. So you don't just hear those transients, you hear the whole thing come through. Uh, so let's go on to vocals then. Here we have a vocal passage, and this one you can really kind of tell. A lot of people use vocals as their number one descriptor for uh, compression and how compression works. Now if you look at this, you can see right away that this part right here is much louder than this part. This part here is much louder than that part. Let's listen to it. So this is just the raw vocal with some EQ on for um, getting some frequencies uh, up and out and things. And though he can't remember faces, baby, he knew with hers he wasn't meant to. She had the innocence of youth, the complexion of an angel. So in this song, uh, this is my good friend Chris, my band Too Far Down, or Too Far Down from 20 years ago. I'll put a card up here for the mix uh, that I did, uh, the Back in Time mix where I mixed this whole song. Uh, he is going for this like uh, call and answer thing. So he has, uh, and a lot of the, the whole song is kind of like that. Uh, he has this one phrase that he says, and then he says the next phrase. It's almost like a breathy after effect. That's really cool. But in a in a mix, it's going to be lost. The other instruments are just going to step all over it. You're not going to be really be able to tell. You still want to be able to hear the words, even though he's doing that breathy, effecty thing. But you want to be able to hear what he's saying. Um, so for this, let's go back to recomp here. And there is a um, there's a preset in here for aggressive vocal, modern vocal, background vocal. Let's choose modern vocal. See what it does. So it's uh, basically, I don't know why it's 9.9 .9 and not 10. I don't know what weird knee is. I don't know why it's one point, you know, 5.2 instead of four. So let's just, for my sake of my OCD, let's do a 10 millisecond and 50 millisecond for attack release. We'll uncheck weird knee. We'll choose a four to one ratio. I'm gonna get rid of this low pass and high pass because I'm dealing with these things through EQ and uh, DS or after the fact. And then let's just take the, uh, the ratio down i mean in it for the presets here it, it automatically puts it at negative 21.7 how does it know what level your vocal's at um this is me against presets i guess but let's just take the the attack I, so let's say this attack release ratio are good for presets everything else kind of ignore i'm leaving the knee size in because why not uh and you know what i'm taking it down to zero so let's listen to these and i'll dial into compression here and though we can't remember faces baby he knew with hers he wasn't. So that was nowhere near enough. I want a lot on vocals. I want the performance to kind of even itself out. The breathy stuff is still going to come through and it's still going to be, um, have dynamics with having the same volume. So I'm going to pull this down. I, I'm going to aim for 12 dB or so a gain reduction on the high parts. And though he can't remember faces, baby, he knew with hers he wasn't meant to. She had the innocence of youth, the complexion of an angel. Let's just go to that complexion of an angel part. Um, and granted, there is some volume being added here, but just listen how much better it comes through with the compressor off versus on. This is off. The complexion of an angel. On. 
the complexion of an angel. All of the accents are there, the, the consonants and the uh, when he tapers off a word, it comes through much better. Um, I really, really, really compress the vocals heavily in rock and even the funk stuff that I'm doing. This is kind of a rock funk genre, the same as my band now. Um, I really want these vocals to be up front, almost a pop style vocal, which those are super compressed. You're going to see 20 dB plus of gain reduction at some of these and the makeup gain all the way up. So I mentioned earlier, compression is kind of done in layers. Now let's look at the mix for this actual song. Uh, I'm not going to zoom in a lot on it, um, but you'll notice I have compression on the kick, on the snare, on the toms, on the overheads. Then I put more compression on the drum bus itself, and I'm not doing much in each of these. And this is why I mentioned like this three to five dB gain reduction thing. I'm doing three to five dB across 20 different things and it compresses everything and pulls it together. And then I'll put a card here for uh, my mix bus processing. I put another compressor on the master fader. I'm doing that for to bring all the instruments together. I'm not doing much. Uh, I think it's one and a half or two dB of gain reduction at most, but that brings in those kind of tames those peaks down, kind of brings everything together and just, just gets it to sound more cohesive. You really don't want to mix the sound like a live band where somebody on the right side of the stage is coming out of this speaker, someone's coming out of that speaker, and there's you know peaks and, and, and things all over the place. You want it to sound like this commercial track that you hear. You know, with those of us growing up, we heard highly compressed stuff on the radio. Today we hear highly compressed stuff on YouTube and Spotify. That's just the norm. That's what our ears are 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 geared towards. We don't want to have something that's like super loud one second, super quiet the next. We want everything to kind of be even and you can have dynamics and still have compression and still have things be even, but you're not taking like one thing and all of a sudden, wham, there's like a giant whistle that comes out of nowhere. I see you, uh, David Lee Roth, uh, run out with the devil. Um, but we just have, you know, multiple different layers of compression. One other thing I wanted to show is parallel compression for drums. Now I do have a video on this. If I have any cards, I'll put this up here. Parallel, most for now, I've done 3 to 5 dB at gain reduction. I haven't really overdone it. Uh, but then there's this. Wow. Um, that's huge. That is, I'm using the SSL native bus compressor here, uh, version 6, which is actually their first one, I guess. And now they're on V2, which is their second one over V6. I don't know. Um, Watch the compression needle, and this is, it's, it's reverse of the other needle that we looked at, which is the VU meter. This is actually showing how much uh, gain reduction there is, and watch the needle fly up there. Now, by itself, this doesn't sound very good, um, but when you take this and then you mix it in with your drum level, you get uh, something that sounds, and in fact, let me play drums before and after the compre uh, parallel compressor. Here's the normal drums. And then here's that in the compression. You really notice it with the snare. Uh, the kick is there too. There's more thump. There's more. This is primarily for an attack. Uh, in fact, I have an EQ on this that um, kind of takes off the lows and the highs. So there's not going to add any thump, but it's going to ta add attack to usually I do kick and snare and toms. Sometimes I don't do toms, sometimes I do. Definitely don't want to do cymbals in this. Um, but take a look at that video and how I do parallel compression. It's just another way of doing compression. You'll notice uh, I have the ratio at 20 to one and the threshold all the way down and the makeup gain all the way up. And then I just, I bring that fader in. I think the fader happens to be at zero just because that's where it ended up. But I do dial that in in the mix. I'll start it all the way down and I'll just bring it up until it sounds good. Um, for for that mix. So that is my dad teaches compression. I went and taught compression here in this video based on how I learned. Uh, I learned from very simple, um, something like Recomp. In fact, my first mixes were all Reaper stock plugins uh, because that's what Graham over at the Recording Revolution kind of emphasized on. Learn your stock plugins first before you go out and buy a third party. Of course, it didn't last long. I went out and got nuts and bought third party and waves and this and that. And I'm actually using more free plugins nowadays than I am third party with Toucan and Analog Obsessions. Uh, but that's another story for another day. Um, 
I would say uh, uh, I'm not using a lot of uh, complex things in a compressor. Uh, I'm not using the like the knee size and the RMS unless I really find something that's going on. I tend to stick with um, third-party compressors for the most part. I like the 1176 as my number one. I like the LA 2A as my number two, and I like the SSL um, either in the S the compressor in the SSL channel or the SSL bus compressor for a lot of things that I'm doing. I find between those, I get 99% of what I need. If I need to do anything else, I'll choose recap first as my first choice. Otherwise, I'll look to something else um, that may be uh, more of a multi, like a tape saturation that has compression in it or something like that. But if I can't get something to work with those, I really have to question the source audio that I'm working with, or if I'm trying to do some kind of a weird effect um, that maybe whatever kind of compression I, I have isn't going to really fix whatever I'm trying to do. Um, I've done a number of videos that include compression, including, and I won't put cards up for all these. You can just go onto my channel and you can search. I just did a voiceover video recently. I've done how to process drums and guitar and vocals is heavy on compression, bass. Uh, I've done all those videos. I probably should redo them now after the fact that the channel has been up for two years. Uh, I may do that sometime in the future, kind of revisit some of these things or maybe YouTube shorts or something of like what I'm doing these days. I've been wanting to do like a top five plugin uh, video, but since I changed from waves to other things, I don't really have one right now. Uh, I may do my top five types of plugins. Uh, I don't know. I, I, it seems like I'm kind of repeating a lot of the things that I did in previous videos, but I might do it anyway, just cause it's content and I can throw a joke and stuff in there. Uh, so as you guys know, I'm trying to hit a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. I think I'm at 980 as of this morning, uh, it's December 4th. I'm hoping to release this on the 5th or the 6th of this coming week. Uh, hopefully get that thousand mark by the end of the year. If you could help me out, do me a favor, hit subscribe, share it out, say, Hey, uh, there's this crazy guy who tells jokes about ostriches and, uh, dyslexic terrorists and, uh, check out his video on compression. Uh, I think that'd be awesome. Uh, apology for the length of the video, but I think this is a topic that yeah, I could talk on for hours, uh, maybe not hours, but uh, I could blooper myself for hours. Maybe I actually have a video on it for hours. But in any case, uh, if you have any questions, comments, anything, leave a, maybe what's your favorite compression plugin? Uh, leave that in the uh, comments. There are some things that I didn't get into. I didn't really get into heavily talking about bus compression or master fader or uh, multi-band compression or any of those types of things. I felt that was too, I, I wanted this to more be a broad, like what is compression and how do I use it kind of video. And I thought I gave enough examples. If you want to see any more things specific, how I would use compression on insert instrument here. And if it's a harmonic or a banjo, I'm going to delete you off my channel. Despite the fact I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers, no offense, maybe a little bit of offense, just a little bit, but, uh, Hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time, have an amazing, uh, until next time.